I'm a woman of no distinction, little importance. I'm a woman of no reputation, save that which is bad. You whisper as I pass by and cast your judgmental glances, but you don't take the time to look at me. You don't get to know me. For to be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known. And otherwise, what is the point of doing either one of them in the first place? I want to be known. I want someone to look me in my face and see more than just two eyes, a nose, a mouth, and two ears. But to see all of me and all that I could be, all of my hopes, loves, fears, but that's too much to hope for, to wish for, to pray for. So I don't. Not anymore. Now I keep it to myself. And by that, I mean the pain. The pain that keeps me in my own private jail. The pain that has brought me here at midday to this well. To ask of a drink is no big deal. But to ask it of me, a woman unclean, ashamed, used and abused, outcast of failure, a disappointment, a sinner. No drink passing from these hands to your lips could ever be refreshing, only condemning. And as I'm sure you condemn me now, but you don't. You are a man of no distinction, but of the utmost importance. A man of a little reputation, at least so far. You whisper to me, and tell me to my face what all those glances have been about. You take the time to look at me, but you don't need to get to know me. To be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known. And you know me. You actually know me, all of me, everything about me, all the, every thought inside, every hair on the top of my head, Every hurt stored up, every hope, every dread, all of my past and future, you know all that I am and could be. You tell me everything. You tell me about me. That which is spoken from another will certainly bring hate and condemnation coming from you. It brings love, mercy, grace, hope, salvation. I have heard of one who has to come to save a wretch like me. And out here in my presence, you say, I am he. To be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known. And I just met you. But I love you. I don't know you, but I want to get to. This is, I must run back to town. This is way too much just for me. There are others, brothers, sisters, lovers, haters, the good and the bad, the sinners and the saints, who, who need to see what you've shown me, to hear what you've told me, who need to taste what you gave me, to feel how you forgave me. To be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known. They all need it. We all do. We need it for our own. To be known is to be loved. To be loved is to be known. And Iris, before she just said on the journey that she's been with us on these three years, that's exactly what we lead women through is to know God, is to love him. To love him is to trust him. Trust him bring us freedom. Trust is the highest form of intimacy. If you're wondering what does it mean looking at him face to face, 
I believe it's trust. It's trusting him with everything. Because we all are that woman, aren't we? I love that when we read about Rebecca this morning, if you remember, I said to you, take note of the well. The servant went to the well to wait for a bride for Isaac. And it was a time, it says, when women came to the well, which was in the evening. But this woman was at the well on her own at noonday. That wasn't the normal time for women to be at the well. And there was a man there already ahead of her, and I believe it was the man, Christ Jesus, who came waiting for a bride. A bride that was broken, rejected, ashamed, full of doubt, hating herself, a woman with a history, and she's exactly the one that Jesus came for. Because he was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief, it says. He understood our pain and our sorrow and our inability to rescue ourselves. And we know these stories, many of us. We've grown up with them. And if you grow up in the church, we can allow this to become so churchy. And just part of something we just take for granted. But if we will just sit and meditate on the, the hugeness that Jesus came and sat by a well and it was the first introduction to anyone to tell them that he was the Messiah that we read about in Isaiah 53, the man that was rejected, majesty that was hidden. She didn't know who he was when she first saw him. And he's asking her for water, just like the servant was at the well for Rebecca. He's asking her, give me a drink. And she says, I can't give you a drink. You're like, you're a man, you're a Jew. What have, what have I got to give? And he's right. She's right. She's got nothing. You know, I was thinking when I was reading that story again this morning, the depth of that woman's need. She keeps going back to the well, taking the water. You have to go back another day. Those of us who are in a human form, we all have to keep going back to refill because nothing in this world ever lasts. Whether it's food or clothing or sleeping, we are dependent every day to replenish certain things. And sometimes we end up going to those things more than we should because we have such deep need. They become an idol, they become a god, they become an addiction that we can't get free from because we desperately need inside us something to fill us and it isn't going to be physical because the need is spiritual. When we're talking about bridegroom and marriage, we're not talking about something physical because Jesus said to the Sadducees when they spoke to him and they tried to trick him and they said, you know, the seven brothers, like which one is she married to? This one marries her and he dies and this one marries her and he dies. I mean, what ridiculous questions, seven times. I mean, that was the way they did it in the Old Testament. But these guys were really pushing it with Jesus. And they were, they were ignorant. Because he said, like, in this age, marriage exists. But in the age, because they wanted to know about whose wife is she in the resurrection? Which of the six husbands? And Jesus said, there is no marriage in heaven. So if you're wondering about what happens if you've been married more than once, what's going to happen when I get to heaven? Which one's my husband? In his wisdom, God says, you won't have to worry about that because in heaven there's neither male or female. Neither, there's neither giving in marriage or taking in marriage. There is no marriage. Those of you who will be really glad to hear that, <laughs> you've been like, hallelujah, free at last. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's some men that are saying that too. So it's not just wives. I think there might be husbands too. But that's just life, isn't it? It's like, oh my gosh. But you see, Jesus, it's marriage forever. It's spiritual. Why don't we need marriage in heaven? Because we, his people, are the bride and the lamb is the husband. And the whole reason that we have marriage on the physical level is because it is a foreshadowing of what God has planned for us. We get so stuck in the reality of this world that we're in, we forget it's short. It's just a breath and it's gone. 
70 years, maybe 80. My dad's 90 next year. What a, what a blessing. He's had 90 years. But in the Bible, it doesn't guarantee us 90 years. Life is short. We make it so much about what we're doing in this life, getting the right husband, having the right children, having the right job, living the right life. And our whole life is all dependent on what we do now and where we will spend eternity. Will we be at the marriage supper of the Lamb? We'll talk about that this afternoon, but I'm not going to jump ahead on that one. First of all, I, um, I want to share something with you can find my notes here, that uh, a story that I heard um, from a, a missionary friend of mine with Pioneers, and it came from a, what they call a, a redemptive analogy. It means a story, something physical. Our butterfly story is a redemptive analogy. It's a picture that is used to explain the gospel. <clears throat> and these missionaries were in, um, I believe it was Papua New Guinea. And the missionary was out with an unreached people group in the rainforest where it very heavy rains and they have silkworms um, during these rains the silkworms go and hide in trees and the rains are so heavy that if they don't have a shelter it will the rain will come down it will kill them all and so what happens is that one of these silkworms forms a chrysalis which covers all the other silkworms. And as it covers them, the outside silkworm takes the, the hit or takes the rain, if you like, and it dies. He dies, but all the others are saved. And if you could put that slide up for me. Here's a picture of those, you can see the man's finger showing the little silkworm as it starts. The one on the bottom left is showing the covering underneath. There are uh, cocoons with one big covering cocoon. And these people groups call this, uh, <clears throat> I guess, butterflies, the covering one that dies, they call it the butterfly bridegroom. The butterfly bridegroom. When I heard that story, I'd always wanted to teach on the bride. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if you come into our, our Love and Veil journey, you'll realize I've got a curriculum of three years workbooks. And the last book has always had a, it's on the, the list of lessons that we'll teach. And it's on the bride. And I've never written that book. I've, and some of you have heard me saying that. <clears throat> it's been 12, maybe 15 years. Um, and I could never see the connection with the butterfly teaching, because we use the butterfly example for transformation. I'm like, how does that fit with the bride? When they told me this story, I was like, wow, that's what I've been waiting for. <laughs> we needed the butterfly story. And there is a butterfly bridegroom who dies to save the other butterflies, which is incredible, isn't it? The difference for our butterfly bridegroom is that he rose again. That butterfly dies and it does not get resurrected as far as I know. <laughs> but our bridegroom died to cover us, to give us a protection so that we could live again. Who is this butterfly bridegroom? And once we are married to him spiritually, what does that mean for us? Look at your notes on page six. Let's read what it says there, these scriptures. First of all, it says, we love him because he first loved us. I think about that woman at the well, so desperate. That, that girl uh, does such an incredible rendition, a, a modern day rendition of the woman at the well. The depth of her heart, I think many of us would identify with her. And to know that it's Jesus that initiates love. We don't love him because we loved him first. We love because he loved it. He comes after us. He pursues us and we respond. We didn't go chasing after God. Sometimes we think we did, but he's been the one that chased us. He came from heaven to find us. And so we love because he first loved us. If you don't know that today, somebody in this room may want to hear that. God loves you, whether you feel loved or not. It doesn't change the fact that he loves you. And he invites you to be his daughter and to be the bride of his son. That's his invitation. And it's not based on my worthiness or whether I look good enough or whether my life's cleaned up. 
Now, once that we're, we're committed and we accept his invitation, here's what it says in the New Testament about the bridegroom and us. Therefore, my brethren, you've also become dead to the law through the body of Christ that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead that we should bear fruit to God. Spiritually, we are married to Jesus so that we could bear fruit. We said we got to know him intimately if we are going to be multipliers of spiritual multiplication. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and you're not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. I, I was reading that the other day. You are not your own, Liz. We don't belong to ourselves. Why? Because we were bought at a price. We were purchased. If you have received the gift of salvation, you were basically giving up your life and saying, it's no longer mine. I give it to you, Lord. I don't own myself anymore. You own me. You fill me with your Holy Spirit. I belong to you. My body belongs to you. What I do with my body belongs to you. The decisions that I make, how I clothe myself, what I put in my mouth. I, when I read these verses, it's very convicting. Like I need to take care of this body, not because I worship my body, but because it belongs to God. It needs to glorify him. My spirit, my thoughts, my emotions, they all belong to him. And I thank the Lord that he's given us the Holy Spirit to help us with all of that. We're not alone. Here's what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 to 3. I am jealous with you, with God, for you with godly jealousy, Paul says to the church. For I betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin bride to Christ. But I fear that somehow the serpent, just as he deceived Eve with his craftiness, so your minds will be com corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. The simplicity, how complicated do we make it? We make our relationship so complicated and it's so simple. Keep it simple. The blood of Jesus has washed away all sin. I trust in him. He is mine and I am his end of story. It doesn't have to be a seminar class to understand that. Anything else is additional, but the bottom line is keep the gospel simple. Jesus never intended it to be complicated. He wants the gospel to go out to everyone so that everyone can understand it and everyone can receive it. It's not for intellectual people. In fact, they're the ones that have the hardest time with it. It's a simple message. And yet Jesus said that many people who are wise, they don't understand it. And yet he gives us understanding. Husbands, love your wives. Now, I'm putting this here, and I've missed the first part out, which was wives, submit to your husbands. I did not do that intentionally. The reason I'm quoting these particular verses is because I wanted to focus on what Jesus' role is in our lives. <laughs> he says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. That's how Jesus loves her. He loves us and he gave his life for the church, the bride, that he may what? Sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. We read that in Ezekiel. That he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. It's amazing that the church of God is holy and without blemish. In, um, I think it's Song of Song, chapter 4, verse 7, he says, You are beautiful, my beloved. There is no spot on you. Can you receive that today? If Jesus Christ lives in you and you are washed and cleansed by him, God looks at you and says, You are beautiful. There's no spot and no wrinkle. And as we get older, that is a great word. <laughs> no wrinkles, no spots, no blemishes, no sun blemishes. It's pure before God. So I'm all about working on the eternal just now. <laughs> because it's hard work trying to keep up with the physical, which is dying daily. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. 
for we are members of his body and his flesh and bones. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. The part I underlined here in Ephesians 5, verse 28 to 31, is, but nourishes and cherishes. I love those words. Jesus nourishes and cherishes, cherishes the church. Now, as a woman, those two words touch my heart. Do they touch you? I don't know what it's like for a guy to receive those words, but Jesus is saying this to the whole church. I nourish and I cherish the church. He feeds the church. He cherishes, he holds the church so close to his affections. And he does that as a body and he does it individually. If you feel that you're not being nourished or cherished at home by your family, by your husband, by whoever, by even your parents, you go to Jesus. I heard a, a, a woman um, speaking one day and she was talking about this and talking about identity and she said, don't be needy for your husband, be needy for Jesus. The, the, the problem for so many I, I hear from women is that trying to get your value and get your love from a man or a woman or a daughter or a friend or a parent can so often be so disappointing. But if I take my nourishing and my cherishing from Jesus, then I don't need to be needy for other people. I can give out of a full heart because I know I'm loved. I receive from him and then I can freely give. <laughs> if you feel rejected, another verse to go to is um, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 6. That in the New King James, and you can write this one down, we are accepted in the beloved. It doesn't say that in every translation, but in the New King James it says, we are accepted in the beloved. You might be rejected by everybody else. But in him, we are accepted. That's a great word. Nourish, cherish, accepted. That's the bride. That's how God sees us. I want to share with you something which I hope will help um, <clears throat> to encapsulate the whole teaching of the bride. And some of you may have heard this, some of you may not. And it's looking at ancient Jewish wedding traditions. I think a lot of these particularly came from Galilean wedding traditions. Jesus, of course, was raised in Galilee. The disciples were Galilean. And they would understand certain teachings that Jesus was bringing. They would understand it in the context of a Galilean wedding tradition. It would mean a lot to them, much more so maybe than it would mean to us unless we are made aware of that. And so when I first heard this years ago, it's been something I've always wanted to share because it really helped me to think about our role as the bride, what the Bible says. But the whole journey of the Jewish wedding, starting with, and if you, you want to follow along with me on page eight, you'll see I, I made some notes. You can follow up the scriptures when you get home. It's a great study to just look up these scriptures and say what the Bible says. But <clears throat> The first thing that would happen in the Jewish tradition, and some of this you'll recognize from the lesson on Rebecca. You'll see some parallels, and there are other scriptures that will show how this happened. But in the tradition, um, in the Old Testament, we see the marriage was usually arranged by the parents, and it was usually the father of the groom that was the initiator. And for us, we see the parallel that it's God the Father who initiates the relationship between Jesus, the bridegroom, looking for a bride among his people. And so the match would be made by the father, and there was a, and it was agreed with the, the father-in-law, the, i.e. the father of the bride. And the groom had a choice. He was allowed to, to consider whether he wanted this bride. But also, the bride had a, had a choice. She could also make a decision whether to say yes or no, like we saw with Rebecca. She could have said no to the offer. And I think that would suggest for us that when the Holy Spirit, who is an agent, and they would be allowed in the traditions to use an agent. In fact, when I was working in India, um, I went to a couple of arranged marriages, Christian, Christian families, 
and there was a matchmaker and she got money for doing it and I was like wow that I was shocked <laughs> but as I sat and watched the interaction between the two families I really saw the benefit of it and the protection of the woman in the whole discussion the interest of the woman was at heart like taking care of her making sure that she was going to be safe provided for protected was the discussion of both the fathers when it's done in the right context it's a good thing when it's twisted without god in it and it becomes a heathen tradition it's a very bad thing because the woman becomes a, an object of sale um and and horrible things happen to women in um marriages where i think god has not been in it and it's not been doing done his way some they work out well um, some don't but watching it in India was a real great lesson for me to see how God uses that in a good way and often we'll use an agent and for us the Lord uses the Holy Spirit as the agent to woo us as we said then the other thing that happened was there was a bride price the mohar the bride price was a legal requirement it was something that had to be paid and it was an indication of the bride's value. And so we can see the parallel with, with us that there is a price has to be paid for the bride. And the father puts the value. And John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world, he gave what as the price? His own son. His only son was the one that paid the price for the bride. And he paid before the bride said yes. He already said, I'm going to pay in advance. And whoever will receive me as their bridegroom, they are welcome into my bridal covenant. And yet, it wasn't just the, uh, the payment of the bride. There were other things that came to it and that was love gifts love gifts which were given from the groom to the bride and those love gifts um, were given as a part of a from their heart they didn't have to give them what things is it that that we receive from jesus eternal life eternal life spiritual gifts peace he says my peace i give to you he says anything that you ask in my name you will have anything so basically anything that we ask in his name when we become his bride we can have it but the greatest gift is he says I give you eternal life that's the gift that he gives from his heart and then there were dowry gifts which were given to the bride by her father to equip her for a new life and that was part of her inheritance and those gifts would be like um, our spiritual gifts the different gifts that are li listed in the Bible and in 1 Corinthians particularly and the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says, I will give you a helper that will come and live with you, to be with you and to guide you in all truth. So the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then there was the ketuba. It was called the marriage contract. And this was a written document stating the price of the bride, the rights of the bride and the promises of the groom. And in terms of the Old Testament, um, in spiritual terms, the marriage contract would be the law, the Ten Commandments, the Old Covenant. In the New Covenant, it's not the letter of the law, it's the Spirit, isn't it? That he comes to live in us, and Jesus said he poured out his blood as the New Covenant. And Jeremiah chapter 31 talks about that he will come and live in our hearts and change our hearts. We have a new heart and so the new covenant is established by faith in our hearts our relationship with jesus is solidified but it happens the betrothal actually happens through a cup of acceptance and this is the part which i find really exciting and i think about it every time we have the lord's supper or communion that when the bridegroom has has accepted the woman he's going to to marry it's been agreed with the fathers he then goes to the bride and he takes a cup of wine and he offers it to her. He drinks it and then he gives it to her. And if she accepts the cup and she drinks from it, then the deal is sealed, as they say. That's the cup of acceptance. Now, what does that, what's that a symbolic for, for us? 
What's the cup of acceptance for us? Anyone. The blood of Jesus. When we come to the communion table, and we say that this is, Jesus said, this is my blood poured out for you, right? This do in remembrance of me. So when we come for communion, we are, of course, remembering his death. And that washes away the past. But you know what? There's so much more. We need to remember his love and what he's taken us into, which is a future with him as his bride. And every time we have communion, he says, do it as often, like as many times as you gather together. Remember me. Remember my love for you. Remember that I'm waiting for you. I won't drink this again until I go to my father's house, until you come again to be with me in my father's house. And then we'll drink it together. And that will be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so he offers her this cup of acceptance. And then they have a covenant. Now they're married, but not consummated. It's a betrothal. And in the Jewish tradition, it was as legally binding as uh, their engagement, if you like, was as legally binding as our marriage would be. But they're not living together. Here's what happens. The bridegroom, after the bride accepts the cup, he leaves. He goes back to his father's house to prepare a room for her. He has to build a room for her to come and live with him in his father's house. I don't know whether that rings any bells with you, but if you remember John chapter 14, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. I'm going to my father's house to prepare a place for you. And I will come again and take you with me to be there. That's where the disciples would understand what Jesus was saying. Because that's exactly what happened in Jewish wedding tradition. That the bridegroom would accept the bride. They're now betrothed. And then he goes back to his father's home to build a house for her. And it was at least nine months that he'd be gone if you've got any clues, the reason being that was the testing time to make sure she was truly pure. It was a time for the bride to prove her chastity. It was a time of anticipation. It was a time of preparedness. She had to prepare herself. You know, you watch these programs on the, on the dress, I think it's called. I don't know what it is on TV. Uh, you flick through it. What is it called, Tracy? <laughs> dress? When they go and spend $30,000 on a dress, you know. Oh, you all know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> you can tell how often I watch it. <laughs> it irritates me because I'm thinking, $30,000, what could you do with that in your first year of marriage? I'd be like, can we put it into the house? You know, like, really? She's already got the dress. Jesus has clothed her with his righteousness. He's saying, now make yourself ready. How? He's leaving you here for a job to do. Jesus has left. He's gone back to his heavenly home where he is preparing rooms for us to live in. Isn't that great? He is preparing a place for his bride. There's a room for each one of us. There's a place for each of us. And there are more rooms being built because the building isn't finished yet. How do we know? Because the father hasn't sent the son back. Because God says he is not willing that any should perish. Because the father's heart is still longing for more to come in to be the bride of his son. And he will wait until there's no person left on this earth who says yes. And if you read through uh, Revelation from, from the first book to the last, you can see God continuously giving opportunities, especially after uh, the tribulations, the wrath that's going to come across the, upon the world when the church is gone, when the restraining power of the church is gone. The wrath of God will come. It will be terrible. And there are a few moments where people actually say yes, they cry out to God. And there will be a call out to the Jewish people to receive him. But most of them, they turn against God. It's amazing to read. It's terrifying to read. But it helps me to understand when I'm reading it. God is waiting until I think there is, in his heart, he's going like, I, I waited so long, there's nobody left. All I've done is get harder and harder against me. Now it's time. Go get my children. It's going to happen. It, I honestly, I used to think that I would only ever teach this message when Jesus was about to come back. 
and I am not predicting. <laughs> but I can tell you, and you can tell, if we watch the news, we are not stupid. We can understand the times. He could come at any moment. Are we ready? This is what God's saying to the church. Is the bride ready? Are we ready? Are we longing for him? The bride, in those nine months, it would be very easy for her to take her eyes off. Now, it could have been longer than nine months. That was the thing. She didn't know how long. It might have been nine. It could have been a year. It could have been more than a year. The bridegroom would be anxious to come back. He's a young man in love. He just wants to get the house done and get there. And the father's like, no, nope, he's the wiser, older man. This house needs to be finished. It needs to be done well. It's where you're going to live with your family. It needs to be finished well. So he alone is the one who knows the time. The Bible tells us only the father, Jesus said, only the father knows when he will send the son back. The father in his wisdom knows when the house is ready. Even Jesus doesn't know when he's coming back, but he's still longing for us. He's still wanting to be here. Is the bride longing for him? Are we longing for him? Or do we get distracted? Or do you know, I was, when I was teaching in India, we were actually talking about the bride and there was a, a leader of one of the churches where I was working with the women and we were talking about being the bride. And this Christian leader who'd been sitting at the back um, came up to me afterwards and he said, do you believe that stuff? I was like, what? <laughs> he said, he was one of the assistant pastors in the church. He said, we've been preaching this for years that he's coming back. He hasn't come. Do you believe it? And I, I thought about the, There's a verse in the Bible that says that's what they'll say. They'll say, really? You still believe that he's coming? He hasn't come so far. Well, do I believe the word or not? If he says he's coming, he's coming. That's faith. That's what it means to live by faith and not by sight. To live with an eternal mindset to get up every morning and say, he could come today. Now, I'm telling you that as I'm saying that to you, I'm speaking to myself. <laughs> I have to speak to myself and say, Lord, is my mindset on eternity today or is it on Liz and the things around me? And it's very easy to get caught up with the distractions of the world, the things that take our attention. And there's many things that take our attention. But if we will at the forefront of our minds remember who we are and what we're waiting for, I think it will give us hope in the midst of our trials and our problems and our fears. To say, you know what, this is temporary. And you might be in a bad situation now, but it's not going to be forever. Because Jesus is up there preparing a better place for us. He's going to come again and take us to be with him are we ready? Let's look at the scriptures and what it says. At the bottom of page 9, halfway down, 1 Thessalonians verse 4, 16 to 17, here's what it says. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then he who are, those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. He's going to sound the trumpet and we're going to go. And when the bride came back, sorry, the bridegroom came back to find his Jewish bride, they usually came in the middle of the night because it, it was romantic to spring a surprise on her. That's why she had to be ready all the time with her lamp lit because it would be dark. She sometimes would sleep in her wedding dress the closer she thought the sign was coming because he could come at any moment. And she needed to have her oil in her lamp and be ready to go. And he would sound the trumpet and she would get excited. And they would come along with a, <clears throat> a litter-like thing. It was like something just off the ground. And they would, <clears throat> excuse me, the bridegroom's helpers would lift her off the ground. <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> and they would carry her off into the night. Do you know that song if you're raised in Southern Gospel? <clears throat> I'll fly away. <laughs> I'll fly away, sweet Jesus. <laughs> We're all going to fly away. And somebody said that's not biblical. Well, it actually is according to this because the tradition was they lifted her up and literally the word they used was she flew away. They carried her in this. Sun. And there's a lovely verse in, in Song of Songs. I think it's in chapter seven, maybe. I don't remember chapter six, where it says Solomon comes in his palaquin <clears throat> and it's gilded with gold and silver. He arrives to carry this 
woman off in this beautiful canopy. I don't think in the Galilean weddings they were so beautiful, but the analogy in Song of Songs is for us to know that Jesus comes and this canopy is covered in silver, redemption and gold, the divine character of God and purple, the royalty. And it just gives a picture of what we are going to be carried off in. When that trumpet sounds, we'll get the surprise and we'll be gone. We will fly up in the air to meet him. Praise God. What do we do until then? What do we do until then? How do we live in this current evil world? How do we live with all our stresses and our problems? I want to share quickly. One of the things that the Lord really has laid on my heart for me personally in the last few weeks was um, the verse from... Psalm 91, that he covers us with his feathers and he hides us under his wings as a place of refuge. And I was thinking about the covenant. He has covenanted himself to us. He has committed himself to us. And if you go over to page 11, it says, it's a covenant of love, peace, and protection. And I've put some of the covenants that are in the Bible that you can read about. The new covenant, though, binds us forever to Jesus. Some of you have been through relationships and marriage where your marriage covenant was broken. Because in humanity, we mess things up big time. We don't even understand the word covenant. But if you covenant to be in marriage, God's idea of covenant is you go into that thing determined that you're going to stick together whatever comes. I have a good friend. She's sitting in the room. I may not mention her name, but she has been married a long time. And she told me when they first got married, they chose to never say the D word. It just never became part of the conversation. And there were times when I'm sure they wanted to go through divorce, but they decided that's not what we're going to do because we have committed. We made a covenant. Now, some of you, you have had to go through divorce and it wasn't your fault. It wasn't your choice. And maybe it was. God has made allowance for that. He understands. So this is not about judgment, but it's to try and give a comparison of in our humanity, we mess everything up. But God will never break his covenant with you. He says, I am with you. I betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. Hosea chapter 2, verse 19 to 20. In Isaiah chapter 54, he says, I will not depart from you. My kindness will not depart from you, nor will my covenant of peace. When you're having a hard day, remember God's covenant to you. His covenant of peace, he will never take his peace away from you. He will never take his kindness. How many women... All you want, as you get older in your life, married or unmarried, what you want from a man or anyone is kindness. When we're young and silly, we want passion and a good looking guy and somebody that's going to romance us and buy us all the stuff we want and, you know, all that nonsense. And then you grow up and you go, actually, I just want a guy that's kind. (laughs) Right? I mean, that's wisdom. It's like kindness means so much more than all the stuff, the pressure that we put on guys. Like, no, just be kind, <laughs> you know. But that works two ways. Like, you want kindness? Then be kind. Be kind. If you're not a kind woman, it's very hard for a guy to be kind if he's a human being, you know. But God will be kind even when you're ugly. He says he will never withdraw his kindness from you. There are so many promises in here. He says, you know, that we're more than conquerors through him who loved us because nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. And then verse Isaiah chapter 4, verse 5, at the very bottom, God will create above every dwelling of Mount Zion and above her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory there will be a covering. A covering, which I've put there means hupa. And a hupa was the name given traditionally to the chamber that the bridegroom went to prepare. And it represented authority and protection. Hoopa. H-U-P-P-A-H. Hoopa. Today, a hoopa, you might have a photograph up there, I think, of the hoopa. Today, you've probably seen some of the weddings, the Jewish weddings. They get married under a hoopa. Here's one. It's like a canopy. 
um, but which is, is a symbol of this protection and authority. The bride is coming under the canopy. But originally it meant a whole room. It was the bride's, bridegroom's chamber. And he brought his wife into it. The hoopa. And so, you know, when I've been thinking about being under the shelter of his wings, I think about, Lord, just take me into that hoopa. <laughs> into that place of your authority and your protection and cover me there. And I'm going to finish with a, a, a quick story here before we go on to our discussion uh, next discussion, but I was in, uh, I think in one of the countries in Southeast Asia, oh, India, I was in India, and I had to get over to Thailand, and um, I got news that it was really bad weather, lots of floods in Thailand, and it was very touch and go whether the flights would get in, and if anybody's been in these meetings before, you know that I hate flying, not a good flying person, I'm getting better, as I learned to trust, <laughs> but uh, at those days, it was a, it was a total um, surrender to the Lord to go to the other side of the world, and so they called, the airline called me and told me because of the bad weather, they were not canceling the flight, but they were rerouting it, and we were having to go through a domestic airport in India in, from the middle of the night, which was terrifying to me because there were no English signs in Mumbai, one of the busiest cities in India in the middle of the night on your own, British white girl, Crazy stuff, you know, what on earth was I doing? Lord, I'm already feeling sick in my stomach. And what I, on an airline that I don't know, I've got to go to Kolkata before we even get to town. So all of this was going on. I'm praying all the way. I get to the airport, got through the airport by God's grace. I get on the plane and I go to my seat and there's a newspaper. I pick the newspaper up, I sit down. I open the newspaper up, the headlines, all about safety issues with the airline that I'm now sitting on. <laughs> <laughs> like really bad engines falling off crashes deep I mean you cannot believe it I'm like <gasps> and I can't get off the plane they've closed the doors and, and I have no opportunity to leave and so I just start to feel like I'm going to pass out <laughs> so I can't pass out and I can't cause a scene so I get my and everybody on the plane is Indian except for me and so um, I, I get my Bible out and I go to Psalm 91 and I start reading that scripture through. And then I got my journal out because I, I, need, I wanted to speak it out and I couldn't. So I get my journal out and I start writing. And I write out the whole of Psalm 91 with a red pen. And then I get a highlighter and I go over it in highlighting, <laughs> double emphasizing it under my breath. I'm like, oh, Lord. I mean, I don't know whether we're going to die on this plane, whether we're ever going to take off. Am I going to land in a flood in Thailand? No idea what's going to happen. And as I'm praying, suddenly the captain says, we're ready for takeoff. I'm like, really? Okay, Lord, here we go. So we take off. We're in the air. I'm still praying. I'm still, uh, you know, I'm, you have no idea how much anxiety I had. And then he says, okay, you can unfasten your seatbelt. I'm like, unfasten your seatbelt? Everything's calm. There's no turbulence. Nothing's going down here. What? You know, so off we go. And then I thought, but the, my anxiety has not gone. So all I want to do is get out of my seat and go to the bathroom with my Bible and shout Psalm 91 out loud. I can't do it on the plane, obviously. <laughs> I'll be arrested. And so I usually never leave my seat on the plane. I just want to sit and not move. But I got up found my legs, got to the bathroom, take my Bible, and I start reading Psalm 91. And the verses that I was reading and really crying out, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Okay, I can say that here and just read it quite normally. I was yelling this thing out, Lord. You have promised that because I love you, you will set me on high. You will deliver me from trouble. Oh God, please deliver me. How many times do you have to take me across this journey? I love these women, but not as much as you do. Please take me out of this ministry. Don't let me have to do this job anymore, Lord. I can't do this. Can you hear me, Lord? I just, please help me. I'm so flipping scared. Please help me. And I mean, it was really that loud. I don't know whether they could hear it or not. But it was yelling. I must have been 10 minutes in that place until I said it out loud enough that my spirit started to come and I actually started to get a hold of the promise. It started to move from my head down to my heart, into my stomach. Calm came. I took my eyes off the situation and God raised me higher. 
I mean, I'm at 37,000 feet, but he's taking me spiritually way above the clouds. And I'm like, okay, I can praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. It doesn't matter what happens to me. This plane goes down, I'm going higher. I mean, finally, I got freedom, but I had to yell it out. I had to cry for my freedom. You have to cry out for your freedom. How desperate are you? I have been in so many desperate situations. That's where the word of God's come alive. Not with my clean little white prayers that are just, you know, Aretha's nodding her head at the back. She knows, like the black churches know how to do this. The Spanish churches know how to do this. The white church needs to get a wake-up call. We need to learn some things about releasing our properness to say, God, it's horrible, it's snotty, it's wet, it's nasty, it's ugly. It's the woman at the well who's desperate. Are you desperate to see God work in your life? He will put you in situations to test you, to see what's in your heart, but to reveal himself to you. I am so thankful that God has put me through those things. I ask him to never do it again. (laughs) never again Lord please and he's just sent me an invitation that I need to do again next October and my board's told me I need to listen to the Lord and go and I'm like no not again Lord but (laughs) I'm going back to some of those areas I thought I would never have to go apparently hopefully I'm a bigger girl now but (laughs) but crying out to the Lord is so important okay the story's not finished I'm running beyond what I should have done but I'm going to tell you the finish of the story because it got better I made it to Kolkata. I even made it to the next flight to Thailand in Bangkok. We land in Bangkok. Weather was horrible, but we got down safely. By the way, every other ministry had canceled their flights and their conferences. Not my ministry. No, God's got me going there no matter what's happening. Like lunacy. God, what on earth are you doing? You know? But we land. I get there safely. I get to the hotel. It was a holiday express. I get to the counter and sorry. Your room's overbooked. Okay. And uh, (laughs) I've just spent six weeks in India. I look a mess, like dust everywhere. I've got Indian clothes on, covered in dust, very simple clothes because the areas that we were in, Martha and I traveling, my luggage is falling apart and filthy because of the roads that I've traveled with it, yanking it behind me. And they say to me, we've upgraded you to our sister hotel, which was the... Bangkok Continental, I think. Five Star Hotel. Now, Five Star in Bangkok is like oh, out of this world. It's incredible. They lead me across the corridor to this beautiful hotel. I'm ashamed because everybody around is in the height of fashion, fashion couture at its best. And there's me, you know, <laughs> shaking, filthy, scabby luggage. <laughs> and I'm walking. Up. I shouldn't, I don't deserve to be, what am I doing here? Talk about feeling like the ragged king's daughter. And I get up to reception and they say, you're on the 24th floor. I'm like, wow. This very pristine young man, bellboy, takes my luggage and treating me like a queen, even though I looked like a beggar, treats me like a queen, takes me in the elevator all the way up to the 24th floor and swings open the door. And my heart just stopped. The view at the top was magnificent absolutely magnificent and I was like Lord you set me on high in a good way (laughs) this is the kind of high I can take (laughs) this is good (laughs) and then I heard the bellboy leaving and the door opened and as he went out the door I had this vision of a bride an Asian bride walking past my door in a vision of beauty and gorgeousness and she walks in front down to the elevator, and I go out, and I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh, wow. And again, my breath was taken away. And I had this moment of envy. And as I was looking at her, I heard the Lord say, you are my bride. I love you. And because you have loved me, I have set you on high. And I will always deliver you. Because you are mine. I will always hide you under my wings in the secret place because you love me. That's my covenant to you. I am your husband. And that's what God is saying to each one of us. I pray God he doesn't ever put you on a plane to learn that that lesson. (laughs) Or maybe you would be okay with it. But to learn that he says he has covenanted with us. He has taken us into the hoopah. 
In the tabernacle, there were cherubim that covered the mercy seat. They had wings that were sheltering. They were the protection that covered. And we are under that covering, that secret place that God has given each one of us. No matter what's happening out there, no matter what turbulence is going on, no matter what your fears are, he has promised he covenants himself to us. And he will never, ever break his covenant. And if you love him, he will do amazing things to protect you. Amazing things for his glory. Praise his name. So we are going to go into a time of discussion. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted. (laughs) I'm worn out. We're going to go into a time of discussion here. I think that's what's next on the agenda. Let me catch up with myself here. Um, Yes, your discussion questions are, first of all, have you ever asked yourself what you honestly think deep in your heart about God, his perspective, and about marriage? I'm sorry, yes, about God, whether he's good or bad. I lost my track there. (laughs) That's a deep question. Do we believe God's good? Do we have a secret thing in our heart that says, actually, I don't know if I believe he's good and he's always good and will always do good to me? And the second question you might want to ask is, how does human experience or expectation of marriage impact your perspective about God's perspective on your marriage? Or about his marriage to us? How does your own experience impact your perspective about God's perspective on marriage? And the third question is, how does this teaching on being the royal bride change your perspective on how you see yourself and your purpose? There's a lot there. And um, so we're going to take a few minutes here, have a moment to reflect, and then we'll come back together again in a minute. (coughs) But I wanted to invite Aretha back to do what she is so gifted at doing, which is sharing a form of poetry. And I don't know, did you write this yourself? You did? Amazing. I think you'll be very moved. As if your emotions haven't already been taken through the ringer that I feel like mine have. I don't know about you, but (laughs) but I think this is perfect for what we've been talking about this morning, particularly thinking about that woman at the well. And so, Aretha, thank you so much and coming to share your giftedness and your talent with us. And so this poem written by Aretha is called Women. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, Like she just stated, the title of this piece is called Woman. Woman. God in his ultimate power knew. Knew that when this world was created, there was something of great importance missing. So he invaded the physical structure of a man, and in an instant, the world was well upgraded. See, there's something about a woman who understands she's not defined by the thoughts of humanity, but everything she will be indefinitely lies in the palm of God's hands. Like Esther, like Mary. Trust in God through their adversities. Despite the fiery darts, the flame they overcame, then walked in victory because of the God they proclaimed. His name is God of Israel, so divine, who's never ceased to respond to our heart's cry. Like Hannah, desperately in need to bear Elkanah's seed, he heard her plea and blessed her womb indeed. Like the woman with the issue of blood so severe that no physician could ease her despair. But when she heard the kings of kings was near, she pressed her way through doubt and fear, and by the hem of his garments, every ailment had to bow. Then and still now to the lion of Judah, the mighty deliverer, the great defender, like the woman with the box of alabaster. Negativity and naysayers surrounded her, but he looked beyond her faults, their thoughts, and saw her needs. Sidebar, I'm so glad I serve a God that's not moved by people's opinions of me. And their judgmental obligation plays no participation in whom he's called me to be. 
See, her posture that day marked her a place in history, so don't you ever underestimate the power of a God-fearing woman, a purpose-bearing woman, a woman not driven by the impulse of this life, but by the goodness of God, his power, and his might. She walks by faith and not by sight. The enemy is intimidated by the opening of her eyes every sunrise. The power that lies within you, girl, has already overcome this world. So be ye transformed. Don't you dare conform. Let me remind you of the blood that was shed from those nails and those thorns. The same blood that won your victory before you were formed in your mother's womb, he knew. See, God in his ultimate power knew that your presence on this earth would have been of much value. So woman, whatever you do, never forget the power God placed on the inside of you. Woman, your seed still bruises the serpent's head. Woman, your best days aren't behind, they up ahead. Woman, God sees your heart every tear you ever a shed woman his promises for you are still yes and amen see God being God knew at some point this world is gonna need what he placed on the inside of you so woman whatever you do never forget the purpose God has for you and never you ever forget the love God has for you woman